Welcome to another episode of Smart Contract Research Forum Interviews. I'm your host, James McGurk, filling in for Eugene Leventhal. In this episode, we'll be discussing the intersection of art, research, and Web3 with Eric Barry Drayson. Eric, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, Smart Contract Research Forum. Uh, I'm Eric Barry Drayson. Uh, I'm primarily a media artist and researcher. My background is at the intersection of real-time media art and performance. Um, I work across a number of different areas. Uh, I'm in, in a PhD program at the University of Colorado Boulder in media studies. Uh, I have a um, sort of conceptual art performance project called Dungeon Master. Um, I also work as like a research strategist with startups. Um, and I've been recently working with like kind of more in the augmented reality space. And um, <clears throat> I have been working in the blockchain space since early, like late 2015, early 2016. Oh, and I did, so I did, I did my MFA at the university at Buffalo in emerging practices, where uh, I created a, a thesis exhibition called Exit Strategy, which uh, was really exploring a lot of these ideas at the intersection of Web3 and emergent sociality and conceptual art. All right, fantastic. And as for me, James McGurk, I'm an editor at Scurf, an author and a multimedia artist. So um, before we start talking about uh, the Distributed Art Object Framework, DAOF, um, some of us, uh, you know, some of our listeners might not have been exposed to the idea of research or philosophy being part of the artistic practice. Um, so I was wondering, do you mind sketching out, you know, some of the history of conceptual art and maybe, um, you know, and then kind of discussing the role of contracts and questions of value in art? Sure. Um, so when I, when I talk about this, um, I try and paint a very simplistic picture, uh, cause it, it can be really complicated and there's, you know, there's a lot of nuance and different movements, but basically we're talking about at a sort of a point around the middle of the 20th century when artists you know started getting frustrated with the limitations of two-dimensional representation on a canvas so paintings and tradition like what people think about when they think about fine art they think about paintings they think about maybe sculpture um but artists started feeling frustrated it felt like a lot of the ideas had been sort of exhausted so we start seeing this process, which art historians call the dematerialization of the art object. And what this did was blow open the entire frame for what art could be. And all of a sudden art could become performance. You know, when electronic media started to be uh, more prominent and the cost of using electronic media devices like video, videography equipment became more affordable, artists started using that and they started exploring, well, okay, what is this? What, 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 are, what are the formal properties of this medium? And so all these ideas and history and context that had been previously been applied to two-dimensional representation in painting and then photography and then, you know, sculpture, what is it to use? a medium right what is it what does it mean to use steel or what does it mean to use iron and weld something or like sculpt something out of clay what do these properties of the medium mean those ideas started getting applied to television like what is a communication infrastructure what is this box sitting in my living room right what happens when i like start messing with the circuits and make it do weird things that it wasn't intended to do right and they start treating electricity as a medium uh, as a sculptural medium right and so i uh, there's there's a few examples that i'm going to bring in but the the easiest one is uh, to talk about is Saul Lewitt who was uh, you know a a a graphic visual artist who started making visual works that consisted of sets of instructions L lots of people will talk about him like he was the first generative artist because his works were just sets of instructions for how other people could realize his work. And so he would make these big, uh, you know, grady, gradient type, uh, you know, paintings and his assistants would just go to the place where the work was commissioned and they, it would adapt to whatever wall it was being commissioned to, which is very similar to how, 
you know, media artists work now with projection, right? And with screens, you know, it can kind of adapt to any surface. Uh, and so he was doing this in the early 1950s. And so his work started, became, became dematerial. It became a set of instructions. It became code, right? Um, and so uh, when artists started pushing beyond art objects and making works that were like, well, what if, what if it's just like an idea? What if I instigate a social process? What if I critique the institution of art, you know, itself, uh, you know, the museum? Uh, what if I write a document that like just outlines an idea for a potential piece that can maybe never be realized? What happens if I go into the New Mexico desert and make some giant like sculpture out of dirt, you know, what, what does that mean for me to do that? You know? And so all these other ideas started finding this intersection at what we call art, but the whole system had to then wake up and adapt to these new modalities that were resisting the traditional capitalist infrastructure of buying and selling objects. And so this is where, um, we start talking about contracts, but maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. No, I think that's, uh, no, no, I think you're setting up perfectly. I, I guess, you know, the next question I have is, so what is the distributed art object framework? But, you know, it would be really interesting to hear a little bit more about, um, yeah, about the history of contracts in, in art and kind of what, you know, what the, and especially with media art and how that kind of plays. Right. In. So there's something that was created in the early seventies called the artists reserved rights and transfer agreement. It was made by this kind of conceptual artist and curator, Seth Siegel, and a lawyer named Robert Projansky. And basically the whole concept of this was to create a contract, a very easily replicable contract that can mediate the sale and resale of artworks, protecting the rights of artists that were making these dematerialized artworks. So you had people like Hans Hacke, who's a famous conceptual uh, institutional critique artist, he was working with cybernetics, like, I mean, really incredible person, a big influence of mine, who had a big retrospective in the new museum right before the pandemic started. Um, but he was using this contract to mediate the sale and like the, the, the rights of all of his works. And uh, this was based on an earlier sort of court case in the United States where Robert Rauschenberg tried to instigate and draw to sweet artist resale royalties to protect his art, his his artwork, because he he had works that he sold for like nothing that were then being resold, you know, 10, 15 years later for like astronomical amounts of money at the time. And he's like, I'm living in poverty, people. Like, what's going on? And it just this was something that was very difficult to uh, execute in the United States. In Europe, they apparently have this law that will protect artists, you know, and there's just a much more robust, I think, labor uh protection in europe than there is in the united states um so but you had artists experimenting with contracts and conceptual art starting in like the very very early stages of of the modern art period um the the the, the example that i go to that's considered the sort of seminal piece was a piece by marcel duchamp in 1925 called the um, monte carlo bond where he basically was making fun of hanging out at Monte Carlo and gambling, right? And he created a, a speculative bond for his um, his uh, his uh, investors to invest, or his collectors, I guess, to invest in his art enterprise. He had Man Ray like put this photo of him with like, like covered in shaving cream with like his hair like in devil horns. And um, it was basically like a fake, it was like a bond, but like the ones that were numbered and were, uh, had his artist signature on them were the only valid bonds, right? <laughs> um, yeah, this is like a, on the Christie's website. Um, the other example that I really like is uh, Eve Klein. Basically, uh, he issued um, contract like uh, statements, right? These, these, um, these 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 certificates of authenticity that were for uh, an allotment of empty space and they were sold by the gallerist to collectors and the collector had one had two options they could retain the the certificate right but if they wanted to actually authenticate the artwork and execute it 
they had to dump a certain amount of gold in the Cien River while a gallerist and a lawyer watched. Um, and so he was basically playing with a contractually mediated uh, transaction space as a conceptual artwork. And so I, I love this artwork um, because it was like a huge influence on my thinking about contracts as uh, mediated sociality and as like a relational art form. And so back in 2017, uh, this Canadian artist named Mitchell Chan uh, encoded this piece onto the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and this is before NFTs, he did this. It was a really brilliant piece. Um, also a big influence uh, on my on my work. You know, when I saw that, I was like, boom, mind blown. This is this is basically one of the best blockchain art and only good blockchain art pieces out there. Right. So there's this history of people working with contracts as a medium, making conceptual artworks that are playing with a type of relational space, right? Um, then there's, you know, other parts of this, right, outside of just like, how do we define an artwork? Well, the artwork basically becomes something which is encoded into a contract, right? Like, what, like what, one of the important questions for people working in contemporary art is what is the actual art? For instance, um, well, I'm a, I'm a video artist. I make experimental video art in like the early 1980s, right? So there's a couple of places that you could say like, well, this is the actual art. For some artists, they created video synthesizers and they had walls of circuits, right? They were using to process images. And for some of those artists, they'll say, well, this, this, my, my machine, this is the art. And then yeah. other artists who would maybe go and use those machines would say, well, it's the art, it's the video recording that I recorded on this specific three quarter inch tape deck. And that, that video tape on that three quarter inch tape, that's the art. Others will say, oh, it's just the recorded image. So it's cool. Yeah, digitize it. It's all right because it's just the representation of, the, of that electrical process. Others will say, oh, but I recorded myself performing on the camera and then processed it through that system. So actually the art form, the art object in this case is the performance. So you have four different artists with four divergent notions of what their art is, right? But it's all video art, right? But like, and so you have to account for that in the contract, basically stating for curators, for archivists, all right, you want to mount this in an exhibition 30 years yeah. after the artist died. What is the work? What is the piece? You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's this story that I heard, which I and this may be unfounded. I don't, I don't, I don't remember where I heard this, but it's like an example of this idea, right? Where yeah. Mike Kelly was, they were doing a retrospective of Mike Kelly at like in LA, LACMA maybe, and like the he had some like objects like painted boards that were painted white, and he was projecting on them, and like they went crazy trying to find the exact color white that he used in this installation, you know, in the 80s or whatever. Anyway, they go talk to his friends, another famous artist, and he's like, no, the piece isn't that specific color white. It's whatever white was at the local <laughs> hardware store, right? Yeah. That's like a big difference. Like that's the piece. The piece is what whatever was around. He just used whatever he had, you know, and like you going and manufacturing this specific shade of white in China doesn't actually make it more of the piece than just going and buying whatever – happens to be at the ace hardware down the street you know yeah 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 i heard about that with dan flavin and yeah replacing the fluorescent tubes and everything and them having to specially source them but yeah, it was totally against what the art was supposed to be which was just kind of grabbing them at the you know at the whatever the home depot equivalent was in 1968 or something well right and i was just talking with someone about this actually where was it oh i was in santa fe there's this fantastic um new media uh got like uh, archival gallery where they have it's a collector and they so they, they have archived uh, all these seminal new media artworks starting in the early 1970s and like i, I went there and there was um dara birnbaum was up there and um they had uh, a, a gary hill piece presented and now the thing was he was the the, the um the exhibition director was talking to me and she's like, Oh yeah, we had a Dan Flavin and like this museum spent like, you know, a ton of money buying this Dan Flavin and the piece kind of stipulated like, yeah, like once the light bulb, once the neon dies, like that's it, it's over. <laughs> yeah. But they, 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 so they basically had to go to his estate and say, 
yo, like, look, we're, we can manufacture something that's really, 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 really close to this thing. And we just spent like gazillions of dollars on this piece. You have to let us just like, you know, replace the bulb with this thing. We're having it custom manufactured, you know, and they said yes. Cause it's like, in reality, it's like, you can't really let the piece die like that. You know, um, it's, 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 it's unfair, but that is the interesting thing is that in theory, artists have the right to revoke the title to their artwork, right? We can negate the artwork and say, that is not my work anymore, right? Which separates art from lots of other objects, right? Like assets, like you can't take issue a bond for your business or a stock and then say, oh yeah, that's not actually my stock, you yeah. know? Well, that's really interesting. So, 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 so I guess this is what, so, so this is sort of what the art object in the distributed art object framework is essentially. And so, like, so, so, what is it that you created from this? So, you know, what was, you know, how did you kind of work Web three, you know, use Web three technology to to kind of create this framework? And, and what is the framework? And and how does it sort of help artists or or plan to help artists? Right. Well, so before I before I, I launch into that, I should maybe talk a little bit about how i got there oh please do because um, yeah. that's a little bit like you know that's like an important side note i guess um in terms of thinking about uh just like art in this way right my, my background is creating interactive video art um I, my, one of my primary uh mentors and influences was uh, an artist who you know named benton bainbridge ATC bainbridge who's a you know very well-known new york media artist and so uh for the last well, over 10 years, no, it's not what, like, almost 15 years, I, I've been doing uh, interactive video performance. And I was, you know, really involved in trying to organize community for and spaces for this type of work to happen in New York, uh, where I was located for many years. And so I was uh, both performing, you know, using sort of custom software instruments that generate sound and video. And then I was also curating and organizing shows and exhibitions and festivals to create spaces for this work to be contextualized within the specific framework and lineage and history of uh, experimental video art, right? Like understanding, yes, there's a historicity to this. There's artists that came before us that have been doing it. There's institutions that have been supporting this. And we want to make sure that our work is being presented in dialogue with that stuff as opposed to some of the more commercial applications of this technology like making you know exhibitions for advertising agencies and stuff like that right so i'm just going to show 30 seconds of a uh oh please video yeah. that i uh was of a previous performance Let's see. so uh this is called head games um i'm he created like a feedback system between my body, a head mounted camera and the screen. I'm using wireless sensors uh, on my hands to control and mediate the feedback, right? Between these sort of three points of recursion. And um, the video is being sent into a computer, which is mapping it across these, these, these three walls. And um, the video is also being sent into another piece of software that's generating sound. So you're actually hearing what's being generated on the screen because the video is being uh, basically compressed into an audio buffer, which is being fed into a 60 cycle square wave oscillator, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I toured this prod, this is uh, uh, like the last kind of AV piece that I was touring before the pandemic started. Um, and um, I was, this is basically, yeah, this is my project that was called Diggers. And this particular piece was called Head Games. Um, so I, I was doing this and um, in late 2015, you know, Benton, who, you know, I've been working with forever, started talking to me about like, yo, I've, I've been talking to these really heavy people who are into this blockchain stuff and like Bitcoin. I'm like, oh, yeah. And so he basically started teaching me about it. Right. And he's like, I want to launch this project. And I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm super down to help you. Right. And so we started launching a project called Moving Pictures Gallery, which the concept, this is way before NFTs were a thing. Basically, what we were doing is trying to take work, like what I was just showing you, right, which is performed in real time. It happens 
with a generative process, it happens singularly in time and space. There's not this like I, I can perform this piece dozens of times, but it's different every time. I'm you know I'm uh, I'm in relationship. I'm in dialogue with the machine, right? And so uh, there's a whole community of artists globally that do this type of work. You know, that's an extension of what was happening in the 70s and 80s, right? But now we have more powerful computers and you know, more knowledge that's evenly distributed about how to, you know, hack gear and make this stuff. So we're like, all right, well, let's make a process whereby we can sort of tie this concept of this performative gesture, which happens singularly in time and space to a cryptographic gesture, which is also singular in time and space and addition performance, right, as a type of currency, right? And it was an experimental idea, and I thought at the time it was a really good idea because real-time media, up until actually, like I honestly feel like it's changing in the last year and a half, but two years. But you know, this type of work wasn't didn't have widespread acceptance, uh, and it was very difficult to present this work and find institutional support for this work. So I thought, like, wow, this is cool. We can like support all our friends and create a platform that will allow for them to um, both archive their work, it'll gain some type of legitimacy, and they can make some money off of these performances, right? Yeah. Um, which is, you know, basically we're all living on peanuts at this point, yeah. right? And so we start this process, you know, we're working on it. We were working with some of the original, like some early Ethereum people who, um, you know, were really interesting guys, but it ultimately didn't wind up working out with them. And at that point, we kind of let go of the project because we had been working on it for many months. And we didn't. We realized that we didn't want to start a business, which was what we were starting to see we were being pushed towards by the various people that we were looking to to try and fund this process. I think at the time, uh, Benton and I were thinking about this as a kind of open sourced commons project that was going to create um, a platform that maybe we would eventually make some money from it. But we wouldn't do that at the expense of our community, right? This was fundamentally at its core, a community toolkit, and it needed to be an open source project. But after talking with a lot of these blockchain folks and venture capitalists in New York, we re we quickly realized like these guys want a business plan and they want to know how they're going to sell us out in three to five years. And I think that made us both very uncomfortable. So at that point, we kind of shelved the project. Uh, so this is, you know, mid to late 2016, right? We were working on this. Um, but it, at the time, I became very interested in this idea of contractual mediation. And I, I thought like, wow, like, all right, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that we can do with this beyond just creating uh, a platform for this very one specific type of art. And I'm like, I wonder, like, what else could this could this be what like are there historical precedents that i could follow like is there a way like because like benton was always talking about this is eric this is programmable currency we can literally literally just create an economy from scratch and you know me being a student of political economy you know and that's something i like and very very interested in i'm like wow we can program an economy from scratch what does that even mean i don't know but that's really interesting right and like can we encode better stuff, better behaviors, better attitudes, better fundamental ideologies into how this these systems uh, sort of emerge. And so uh, after that, I um, went to grad school uh, in 2017 uh, at the University of Buffalo, and I started really diving into some of these issues. And so in the beginning, I was not working on the distributed art object framework. It was kind of in the back of my mind but I, I didn't want to take the time to articulate what we had been working on because I was sort of trying to sort of push towards some other um, ideas. So like this was an early piece called the Distributed Autonomous Katamari. It was just a speculative piece. Um, but basically the idea is that we issue these tokens. This is actually, wow, uh, this is like an old piece. I don't actually remember all the aspects of it, but 
Um, so the Katamari Damacy is a video game where you have this kind of ball that rolls over the planet Earth because the king of the world is trying to patch a hole in heaven. And so you, your, your video game character is just this infinitely accumulating ball of desire that just is sucking all things into it, right? And so I started thinking about like some of the environmental, e ecological, and sort of uh, ideological issues that were surrounding blockchain. And so basically, um, we have uh, Chinese server farms here, which are uh, powering the Ethereum blockchain, right? And um, basically, you have these tokens, and they I think they have to be speculated on. So like the idea is that all the the, 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 the fractional owners of this artwork, now this is like a this is a 2017 piece, right? The fractional, so I was thinking about fractional ownership and like collectivity and how the collectors basically have to constantly keep over speculating each other in order for the piece to exist. And if they, if it's the same price, they, they get, re, the, their value gets revoked. Um, but if it goes up, then the piece keeps living, right? And so um, the, to the tokens are encoded to require circulation or they're nullified. The tokens have to trade amongst themselves or speculate on their shares in the open market. Once a token has been traded at a higher value, that value is now assigned to that token indefinitely. So basically this was like before we were really talking about bonding curves, but this piece was kind of in intuiting that concept of a, of a bonding curve applied to a work of art, you know? So the second part of it was basically, uh, so we have smart contracts here and we were holding, we have a hundred ERC 20 tokens. Uh, yeah, and we have just like a firewall. So then in the second diagram, this is where it gets interesting, right? So basically um, we have uh, the Katamari coin value accumulation, right? Uh, which gives it more buying power. And so basically the contract then hires humans to build server farms. Um, and through pattern detection, machine learning and computational uh, power, exponential power increase, we have an automated speculation engine, which is built, right, by humans for the Katamari, right? And uh, basically through investments in real estate, stock market and crypto kitties, right? Um, they, they just have exponential value uh, increase, right? And so they start buying lofts in Bushwick, Brooklyn, which is like, it was a, you know, an area in Brooklyn that I used to live where their artists used to live. Um, and uh, they start speculating on student art school debt, you know? And um, these are all very good investments. So the, they just like, there's just like this sort of exponential value and computation increase, right? And then uh, once it reaches kind of this crescendo, it, it, it reaches AI Weiwei, right? And we, we now have AI Weiwei. We we're, we're just like, we're an artificial art, conceptual art object, right? And then uh, it basically starts collecting uh, abstract paintings and selling abstract paintings at an auction, right? And so once it purchases a Frank Stella, who's like kind of this seminal modern male modernist artist, like, and by the way, it's only, it's only selling a uh, male painting, abstract paintings from dead white male artists, you know? Um, and so it speculates on these dead white male artist paintings, right? And then when it purchases a Frank Stella, who's, who's still alive, but you know, he's kind of the seminal self-reflexive, the frame feeding back on itself, right? higher modern artists, right? We unleash a swarm of Twitter bots that starts hyping all these artists, right? And at that point, we've reached maximum self-reflexivity and we achieve sentience, right? Um, so then once we achieve uh, conceptual art, self-reflexivity, sentience, uh, we start producing works ourselves in the style of dead white male artists, right? And we achieve early success in our career by uh, gathering uh, 70,000 Instagram followers, right? And we start producing art in the likeness of itself. And so we, of course, hire interns. And uh, through maximum reflexivity and indifference, we climb this singularity uh, phallus, right? And then we, we achieve art world singularity, right? And at that point, we, we, we just, there's an implosion, there's a singularity, and all matter on earth is sucked into this massive singularity and we project off of the, the rotting corpse of planet earth to terraform Mars. And then uh, we hold a career retrospective. Um, so that was my early, my first blockchain art project. Um, 
I, I started working on that and I, I started working on this other project called Norm Corp, which was basically this, this idea of an art um, object as a startup. Like I was looking at all these kind of smarmy crypto art startups and I'm like, they're basically like art objects in and of themselves. And I was, I was thinking about DAOs and stuff. And um, th this was another conceptual art project, but the, the idea behind both of these works is that they were basically scaffolding on the distributed art object framework. And so now I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the, the distributed art object framework before I start launching back into um, some of the conceptual art things that I tried, ideas that I tried scaffolding on top of it towards this concept of a distributed art. Um, the, the distributed art object framework was initiated with Benton in, in 2016, right? Um, and then what happened was um, in 2018, I was uh, at NYU for a month. Uh, I was at this thing called ITP Camp, which is um, basically a creative technology unconference that they hold every summer at ITP. And I, I meet this, this, these guys come in one day and they're like these weird older dudes. And um, it turns out they were these like OG distributed systems, blockchain experts who have been doing this stuff like since before I was born. And there was like a couple of different, there was like three or four of them. And they were kind of all in these overlapping collectives and projects. And so I start rapping with them and they invite me into their collectives. Um, so there was a couple of, uh, groups, uh, there was the, the primary one was called CoLab, And, uh, this was an offshoot of the R chain cooperative blockchain. They were all sort of developing technologies and concepts tangential to the development of R chain. And then there was also the digital life collective, which was based in the UK, but had this kind of international crew of systems theorists and designers and, um, UX experts and uh, people that were in, interested in digital identity and cooperatives. And so they were also working on a bunch of really cool, interesting stuff. And so I started a blockchain art research group with the CoLab, right? And there was maybe five or so uh, regular members who were these older dudes who have all been, you know, just working with distributed systems and online cooperation and communities, they just deep, deep, deep knowledge, right? And so we started taking some of the ideas that I, I you know, Benton and I had been talking about and um, updating them basically with, we were looking at different protocols, different technologies that were emerging at the time, right? So um, how do we translate a, a smart contract for what's something that's called object capabilities, which is the primary uh, computational framework that they were using on our chain, which is a, a little bit of a different concept than like what a normal blockchain would be using to create objects. Um, my understanding of it is it's like a, it, it, it's a basically a, you, you modify JavaScript to create persistence, a persistence layer, which allows for you to create these cryptographic objects that don't really need a blockchain to instantiate themselves. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, what they were saying was like, oh, well, we have this special form of calculus, which is how our chain operates, which allows for us to, in theory, scale um, and create infinite amounts of shards. And um, let's say there was sharding. It was proof of, cons of it was Casper proof of uh, stake consensus, like in the beginning. And they could basically scale up to visa level transactions. Right. Um and so we started talking about this and object capabilities and different hashing protocols and um, how do we deal with digital identity and how do we deal with wallets and how do we encode the artist's reserved rights and transfer sale agreement into this technological framework, right? And so we had this extensive conversation and now I, am, I had taken um, some time, a year off from my MFA and so I meet these guys the summer right before I'm going back. So now I'm meeting, I have this development crew that I've been working with and working with all these ideas, but I'm also now back in an art program. So I've just had my head in this heavy duty engineering space, right? Where we're like talking about this, but I now have to demonstrate what I'm doing in order to get a degree as an artist, right? And so now I have to work to sort of tie these ideas into the art historical canon and talk about things like systems art 
conceptual art, you know, and make projects out of it. Otherwise, like they, they would look at what my work is and say, oh, that may or may not be art. We don't necessarily understand this. So what this is, it's a point where we, we were actually much further ahead in the conversation. But in order to create the conceptual scaffolding for things like norm core or the distributed art object or, 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 or the, the Katamari piece, I had to have a model in place that says, okay, here's a bare bones example of what this is. Here are the pieces that we need in order to start thinking about a distributed object, right? Not even as an art object, but just like this is what this is as a technological and legal stack. This isn't the most, wasn't the most current or up-to-date or advanced model that I had, but it was at the point that I had to say, okay, I need to stop because I need to actually show my thinking process, right? So we have four areas, which were basically, how do we define the artwork? What's the certificate of authenticity? Where is this stored, right? Is there a, a unique instance of this stored and decentralized storage? Is there a rights management structure, right, that is uh, flexible enough and encodable to protect the rights of artists and allow for them to interact with pre-existing structures? And then how do you deal with ownership transference, right? And as you could see, like, you know, we're using an ERC. We were looking at the time at ERC 1155. Um, so there was like an NFT component to this, but that wasn't actually the primary point like we were using things like file hashing which was connected to did distributed uh, identifiers right um and that this was all then encoded into the nft but like the point wasn't the actual nft it was the artwork definition and that which then all references the unique instance of the file right so we're saying in this instance that um the file uh is the artwork this file in the case of this art contract is the thing that's being identified as the artwork. So it's not about the actual NFT. It's not about the file. It's the actual stipulation in the contract that stays. This file hashed in this location is the thing. You can copy it. You can download it. You can rehash it again. It doesn't matter because this, this is the thing, right? And so I started thinking about this concept of rematerialization, where it's like this ephemeral digital object becomes the thing itself. And any way in which we materialize that in the real world becomes the, 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 the rematerialization of it. But the actual thing is the digital set of instructions. So think I've got a 3D file located in this location. That's the art object. I can print as many of these as I want, but it, it doesn't matter because the actual art is the idea and it's the file and the set of instructions for how to execute. The distributed art object framework was a technological, a technical and legal stack, which give, gives rise to emergent forms of property. So in the sense like, okay, we've established what this thing is, what the sort of components are that we need, that almost like, it's like almost like all the, all the lenses that are holographically projecting this one thing in time and space, right? Okay, but that's great. However, my criticism was that like we're not actually using this very imaginatively, right? We're basically using this to reinforce pre-existing ownership structures and property relations. And so this is where like my kind of critical theory and political economy brain kicks in and says, oh, why don't we just throw that all out and imagine totally different structures and ways of relating to each other um, that forms a type of economy, you know? Um, and so I spent a long time trying to think about this. I don't know that I came up with any solutions, you know, um, and there's people much, much smarter than me trying to figure this out, you know, in large groups like the, let's say the economic space agency, who I don't know if they figured it out either, but like they're much further ahead. I, I, I basically was like, all right, the best I can do is try and make small experiments um, that would reimagine small forms of sociality as a relational art object, right? It's based on this. It's based on the distributed art object framework, right? And here I have sort of zoomed in diagrams um, defining an artwork. This is what a blockchain is, just to have a definition of it. Here's the certificate of authenticity and what it is. Here's what an ERC token and what we're looking to do with it is. Here's a hashing protocol. This is why we need to use this. Um, here's a rights management structure, right? And like how it relates to traditional art contracts, 
form of ownership. Um, this is a smart contract, like just a definition, I guess, of what a smart contract is and how we'd be using it. Uh, and distributed storage and unique instancing on distributed storage, right? And so then I have like sort of like a longer text that explains what this thing is. Like basically my interest in this was how do we use this to then be in dialogue with some of the systems and conceptual art projects that were in the earlier 20th century, update them and to start reimagining how economy and sociality work. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so 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 how does Normcorp kind of fit into this? Like like where does that uh yeah, what where, where does that fit into all of this? So the idea is that like all right, so we can addition an art object, right? And that art object can really be anything. Um and so I'm saying to myself, huh, why don't I just create a, re a relational structure that is an art object? So I'm like, well, all right. So rather than starting an art project, why don't I like launch a startup and have the lean startup uh, methodology become a performative score for performing the value of this totally empty object? Because I was looking at like the startup, you know, scene in the theatrics and the public relations theater surrounding that. And I'm like, oh, this is fascinating. None of these people have anything. They have nothing, but they're performing the value of it using these methodologies and they just infinitely accrue value. So why don't we just try that? You know, I, so I started researching monochromes in art history, which are basically uh, traditionally paintings or even sculptures, let's say, that have no content. They're just a single color, right? And there's this really interesting concept when you get into it that like okay so throughout history i mean dating back i mean uh, at least to the middle ages as far as i'm aware there have been monochromatic paintings and yet they mean radically different things and that's because the concept of a monochrome is that it, it's reflective of um the larger societal context in which it exists so if I'm a Gnostic mystic in Middle Ages Europe and I make a, 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 like a, a monochromatic painting, that means one thing. If I'm a Russian constructivist, it means something very different, right? And so I started thinking about like, uh, like we value value. We're, we're starting a startup. We value value. The entire structure of this thing is totally self-reflexive and contentless, except for the legality and the performativity of the value itself, right? So here... Um, I have three charts where uh, this is the lean startup uh, strategy control, but it's basically we have ideas and intent. We create a minimum viable product and then we do a SWOT analysis and do a bunch of pivoting. And then um, we kind of, it's very Kabbalistic looking. And then, uh, you know, we kind of ascend the conceptual development uh, until we reach marketplace saturation. So then um, I have a diagram here called Build, Measure, Learn, uh, where we uh, take a leap of faith assumption and uh, through Genshi Genbutsu, uh, the wayfinding path, we uh, build and purify our model through the minimum viable product. And then by measuring cover customer behavior, we use innovation accounting to learn. And then we have learning milestones and growth hypothesis. And then we are able to assert a value hypothesis, and then we rinse and repeat this process over and over again, which uh, leads to our exit strategy, right? Where through the wisdom of the five whys, um, whether we've, we understand, we come to understand our engine of growth, are we viral, sticky, or paid? And then we find our product market fit, which allows for us to ascend the uh, projection through seed capital and series funding, right? up until our exit strategy. And so um, part of this work was I created a laser that was projecting on the ceiling of the exhibition that was projecting the words exit strategy. And the exit strategy was this idea of the art object reaching the consummation of its purpose. It sort of reaches the, the stage where it becomes released from the boundaries of having any type of objecthood at all, right? Which is very similar to like this this, this this trajectory of a startup where it sort of starts and there's all this process and all these things they have to do, but eventually it gets just released into a larger pool of capital, right? It ascends, so to speak. So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> and then, so then I, I created a white paper, which is, um, I don't know if this is, hopefully this works. It's basically, it's an empty, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, my, my concept statement for Normcore, which is, a, it's a web page. 
and it's got a little piece of code in it that allows for just it just continuously uh scrolls like it just keeps adding more and more of itself until if you just keep scrolling right at, at a certain point like you see like the the, the 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 little like scrolly thing on the right hand of the screen just keeps going up and up and it keeps adding more of itself eventually your browser will just be crashed by the profundity of the pure emptiness you know and that that's like that's the concept for the, the statement for norm courts our white paper um so again like this kind of just lived as a speculative project i never wound up like really um showing up and like to like startup conventions and like performing that role this just sort of existed as a thought experiment ultimately right um but again it's it's based it's 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 built on the scaffolding of the distributed art object framework right um another project which also is kind of living as a speculative vibe is um post-capitalist karaoke where um i i tried to create these like karaoke songs um like uh my favorite the share song true believer yeah it's like that share song do you believe in life after love whoa right and so i built this like i made this animation of like a hyper object floating in an infinite horizon and i changed the word love to capitalism right and so it's like do you believe in life after capitalism whoa i don't know think i'm strong enough no and so um the idea behind these were like uh the audience again i'm dealing with like kind of this o this notion of fractional ownership and collectivity and um if i can i create like these sort of micro economies that have these bizarre gamified rule sets um that sort of institute weird behaviors that like sort of becomes part of the sculpture so in order to like earn your share of the artwork so to speak you have to sing the post-capitalist anthem right and you record the video onto decentralized storage and then you're issued i guess shares of the artwork for participating in it right so it's like that but then each one of these videos has some type of something right and so i was trying to figure this out and ultimately I, I was working with some members of the economic space agency for a while trying to figure this out but we never really came up with an actual model that we could use to really create these like sort of bizarre uh relational structures so again this kind of still lives as a speculative artwork that maybe maybe i'll complete at some point but we i don't really part of the issue is that we don't really understand what post-capitalism is and so it's like it's like that um uh, what's his name uh oh my gosh my my brain is just not working this morning who um this famous theorist who writes that we just we simply can't imagine beyond capitalism right like our imagination is limited and so you know we have accelerationists that are saying well let's just intensify everything until capitalism implodes and we all die and maybe there'll be no more capitalism that's like oh cool bro that's great you know I guess the last uh, piece of this was Dungeon Master, which I'm not really going to get into here because that's like a whole other ongoing project, which is sort of, you know, taking this uh, character and sort of talking about some of more of the critical issues surrounding the blockchain. So we created an academic speed metal PowerPoint album called Fear and Trembling on the Blockchain. Uh, and in order to hear our music, you have to download PowerPoint, and actually view the PowerPoint lecture um and so we did released that in 2020 and now we're working on a new set of uh content uh, dealing with block issues related to blockchain chains and political economy and sort of social criticism things oh like my, that yes and I, I i guess so you know i i don't want to take too much of your time but i you know would, would you like to talk a little bit about some of your work with political political economies and kind of like what you know what you think some of the you know how, how might web3 kind of change the relationship with you know, with artists and artists in the broader marketplace or, or how, you know, artists might change the broader marketplace? Yeah, I mean, well, um, there's a couple of answers that I could give to that. Um, but I think, you know, look, when I was doing all this work back in 2017 through like 2020, right? Um I really strongly believe that, you know, there's a there's a history uh, in modern art, electronic art of 
artists intervening in emerging communication systems to try to imagine alternate realities. It was like about creating alternate imaginaries, right? And so the history of, you know, video art and net art, right, was all about like saying, wow, this really powerful emergent technological communication structure is coming. We see lots of problems in it. So let's work together to imagine how this can be used to serve democracy and serve, tell other people people's stories that are not part of the mainstream narrative, right? So you saw community uh, video groups popping up in New York, all over the country that would go and do man on the street interviews, right? And so if you, if, if like, you know, uh, certain groups of people in New York City were being, uh, you know, policed or beaten up in the streets or, you know, they would try and tell those stories because that wasn't being shown on the seven o'clock news, right? Um, and the same thing with net art, it was like, okay, let's take this thing, this wild west and do some really out there, really imaginative stuff with that, right? And so I, I consider myself a part of that tradition, right? And like that, it's, it's critical, it's imaginative, it's playful, but fundamentally we're engaging as artists with this to try and reimagine what this could be. Um, I have to say that at this point, it's March 31st, 2022, I have not seen any of my peers doing that with the blockchain. And so it's 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 a great disappointment because I was really hoping at the point that all of this started taking off, we would start seeing some really imaginative stuff coming out of people. But what seems to happen have happened is because the nature of the technology is inherently financial and it's a, it's it it serves as a type of financialization that mechanism supersedes all alternate possibilities because everyone that i know kind of jumps on it and they're like oh my gosh i can make money now and like that that end sort of superseded any form of criticality that could have existed it was just like oh let me just cash out i've been doing this for so long with no recognition I want my I want mine now, right? And so, I think the the, the my biggest disappointment is that I, I I'm I'm really just not seeing anyone really really interrogating this in a way that uh, I think serves the higher aims of what art could do and how art could serve as a mirror for society. I just see everyone giving into this, um, so. If I'm to answer your question truthfully, um, I don't see Web three as having a positive effect on culture at this point or art. Um, that could change with the right group of people that are really doing radically new things, but um, I think it's going to take a sort of a reset, um, or uh, in order for that to get kicked off. Um, and so I, I, you know, I've kind of taken a little bit of a backseat, uh, especially in the last 18 months when this kind of this during this whole bull market run. And, you know, a lot of the once I started seeing all this stuff go really mainstream, all the super smart, super informed, super passionate people that I've known for the last five or six years, their voices kind of got drowned out by a lot of these very loud people who their primary objective is just being in the spotlight all the time. And so the conversation has really shifted in a very unproductive and very just not useful direction from my from my perspective. And so I've kind of taken a little bit of a a, a break from engaging with it publicly because I don't see it as being beneficial right now. Um, does that does that is that is that sort of what you're going for? Yeah, I, I mean, what do you think? Like, you know, do, give me a utopian vision of of how you know. Let's say that the financial incentives kind of you know people get, you know, they rake in enough money and they sort of you know, and then people kind of shift their focus. You know, what 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 might good Web three art look like? You know, if the serious kind of artists kind of start paying attention to this, you know, what what would it look like? Well, I think you have to um, deal with the nature of the system itself, right? So uh, fundamentally, we're talking about what is the material structure of the system? What are the fundamental kind of um, ideological encodings that are, exist within that system? And can we, so can we start twisting them? Can we sculpt them? Can we, can we create something 
unexpected out of it? Can we glitch the system, right? Can, can, can we apply methodologies to this that breaks it, right? A lot of electronic art is about breaking communication infrastructure, right? Because it's that breakage, it's that slippage in which, which allows new things to emerge. Um, I'm seeing people calling themselves glitch artists posting NFTs. That's not a fun, that's not glitching the system, you know, at all. Um, and so, you know, people encoding types of economies that aren't accumulative and that are um, thinking really deeply about alternate behavior modalities, right? Which is, again, and this is really difficult because like we almost don't know what that could be anymore. I mean, we have concepts of like the gift economy or like barter or exchange, different forms of exchange. We have, um, you know, time banking, we have local currencies that exist, right? And like we can study these concepts. Um, but fundamentally, it seems that the everything gets superseded by just the baseline ideology of how Bitcoin or Ethereum works, you know, um, and that it, it fundamentally turns everything that touches it into a commodified asset. And so from my perspective, you know, if you, you read, uh, you know, the critical theorists from the 1930s who were fleeing fascism and they were sort of very wary of mass culture. And they were talking a lot about like, okay, at the time, like this is how radio commodifies culture. And like, this is how this becomes an, a, a tool of the state and of corporations for mass control and to make us more willing subjects of the market. Well, like this is like a pure crystallization, crystallization of that, right? This is like every single thing that touches the blockchain immediately just becomes a hard speculative asset and is immediately then rocketed into a secondary speculation market. I think fundamentally we have to, yeah, I think this is actually my primary point here is that I think if we're going to have a real conversation about what the potentiality for Web3 is, it cannot under any circumstance be attached to a secondary speculation market. You cannot start a commune and a casino at the same time. And I'm going to repeat that. You cannot start a commune and a casino at the same time. They're just mutually incompatible things. And so we need to be willing to completely negate the spec of the secondary market and create contractual mediation that makes it so our work cannot become a speculative asset on the secondary market immediately. And once you see artists willing to do that, then I start thinking. I start think that I think I start thinking that maybe more interesting things will happen. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it makes sense. I mean, it's just because it's so. Yeah, just the money just kind of overwhelms things and just eats things yeah, up. It, and you you see that in any kind of Web three space, it seems like it just gets swamped with with money and uh, and kind of and it kind of hollows everything else out. But. So thank you so much for talking to us today. And wh where can we find your work? How, how can we find? more about what you're doing and and what you'd like to do? Well, um, you know, I, I have a website, um, ericberrydrazen.com. Um, I'm not, I, I, I'm not really on social media so much these days. Um, I deleted my Facebook and Instagram accounts. So my work isn't on the, either of those places. And um, I'm sort of on Twitter a little bit, um, but not really so much. Um, my The primary creative project I'm working on is called Dungeon Master. And there is an Instagram for Dungeon Master. Um, there's a website for Dungeon Master. So we're on Instagram, Twitter, Bandcamp, um, maybe some other platforms at some point soon. But um, yeah, we're getting ready to release a new project this spring. Um, really excited about it. Uh, it's a critical blockchain project that kind of takes aim at a lot of these sort of underlying tendencies that I'm talking about. Um, so we're releasing a series of new albums and new content uh, re relative to that. We're launching like a, like a cryptocurrency called Dungeon Coin uh, that may or may not exist. And so, um, yeah, DungeonMasterLLC.com, uh, DungeonMasterLLC on Instagram, I think would be the primary places to find that stuff. Well, yeah, thank you so much for, for doing this. And uh, yeah, I, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, man, totally. I appreciate you, uh, you know, inviting me on to uh, have this conversation. It's been fun. Yeah, totally.